So, guten Tag, mein Name ist Jonathan Wovington. Ich äh, arbeite mit Perl 6 und MoVM und mein, mein Deutsch ist so schlecht, so das ist in Englisch. Okay, let's get going. No, I live in the Czech Republic. Okay. Controversy at the start of the talk. <laughs> I thought it was me that was going to cause all the trouble. Okay, so uh, what does an optimizer do? But this will cause trouble. This is a very non-classical definition. Optimizers are primarily about um, taking programs that we would like to write and maintain and turning them into programs that we would like the computer to run. And the programs that we would like the computer to run are nice and compact and don't have lots of polymorphism in them and, you know, duplicate bits of code because it's faster to duplicate code sometimes, sort of, depending on certain circumstances. Um, whereas the programs that we like to write are well factored, we like abstractions, we like to be able to uh, put in little changes and experiment now and then and uh, you know, have a lot of freedom in there. And the job of an optimizer uh, at some level is to take the programs that we wish we can maintain and to turn them into programs that run efficiently. So objects are a big part of this. And uh, who likes objects? Oh. I think objects are mostly a force for good in that they, they, they let us gather related uh, data and functionality together. And when we put related bits of data together, that's both good for us as maintainers of the program, because things that belong together are together. And that's half of what architecture is anyway. Um, and then we, you know, we have them together in memory as well, which is in theory good for the hardware. Um, they also let us work at a higher level of abstraction. So if I want to deal with a complex number, it's much better if I have uh, you know, one variable holding a complex number than I have two variables, one being the imaginary and one being the real part. So it's just very real abstraction benefit there. Um, and they also give us the polymorphism. So you know, we, we can take an object and we can call a, a method on it and the object type will determine which method we call. And these are all kind of nice things. And Perl6 is pretty objecty. Um, so uh, we, we have lots of uh, little objects hanging around. So things like int, num, and string are your objects that uh, just wrap around a native integer and number and string. Actually, int automatically promotes to a big integer. Um, then we have container types. So a scalar is an object, an array is an object, a hash is an object. Uh, and then we have some of these numericish things. So uh, complex, date, rat, range, all of these. So, uh, well, that's, uh, that's quite a selection. And these are things that show up all the time, okay, in very normal code. You don't write much code that isn't dealing with a string or an integer or whatever. And uh, the bad news is that objects are not a free lunch. They have some cost when it comes to method dispatch. That, uh, that cost of the polymorphism comes along, and every time we want to call a method, we have to figure out what method are we actually going to call. Is this some subtype, or uh, you know, has the method been, uh, been over overloaded or overridden or whatever? But other than that, we also have the cost of memory management for objects. So when we allocate an object, we uh, grab a piece of memory, we use it for a while, and then uh, we're done with it. It has to be cleared up and freed so we don't leak it. So we have to have garbage collection. And one of the things that's kind of curious is that while for you as a programmer, it's much easier to talk about objects because they aggregate things together. So this is a complex number, or this is a rational number with a numerator and denominator. And we give it one name, and we talk about it that way. That's good for us. We like to have those black boxes so we don't have to think about everything at once. But the optimizer likes to see everything. It likes to see inside of things and all the details. And when we have objects that are black boxes, optimizers can do less good job. They can analyze the program rest less well. Um, and this frustrates optimization. Now, if you came to my talk last year on these types of topic, uh, you will know that actually the cost of method dispatch is largely a solved problem. Uh, and at least it can be a solved problem if you have the right technology, and with Perl6 we, we do. Um, basically, you, 
you realize that, particularly in dynamic languages, code can be very, very dynamic in theory. But the practice is that actually most code is not very dynamic at all. Uh, so in theory, a given variable might hold something of, you know, 100 different types. But in reality, there's one of them that uh, is actually used. So what we do is we notice this and we produce a specialized version of the program. And uh, that version of the program then can say, oh, we're making a method call. But we don't have to look it up because we know it's exactly this type. So uh, we're done. Okay, so that one, I would argue, is effectively solved. Okay, what I'd like to talk about today is these other two problems. The cost of allocation and garbage collection and the cost of uh, having to suffer from lack of ability to analyze the program so well and uh, therefore losing optimizations. And my hypothesis is that a analysis called escape analysis, which I'm going to explain today, can help us with this. Before we do that, let's talk a little bit more about the problem, though. Here's a tiny snippet of Pel6. We are going over a, uh, an array here of numbers. And uh, this is a bunch of numbers we're calling the sine function on. And uh, sine returns a boxed num. This $SV here is a scalar container. So we assign the num into that. So we're up to two allocations. Plus here is an operator that takes a num and another num and returns another num, which is a boxed object. So this code here does three allocations, okay? which, is, which is quite a lot. Um, and what actually happens at runtime? The way we do memory allocation in more VM is we have a, what we call a nursery. And a nursery is where new objects are born. And it's just a huge, long piece of memory, about four megabytes long. And we just plow through the thing. And so, suppose I want to allocate an object. It will take 32 bytes of memory. So I take my current location. I use that as where the object will live. I add 32, and that's where the next object will live. So we end up with this nice, big, densely packed load of objects. Very, very cheap to allocate, nicely packed together. Um, and when we run out of space at the end of here, we say, ah, we filled our working space. Let's do garbage collection. That's not too bad. That makes allocation relatively fast. But the obvious consequence of this, of course, is when we get to the end, we have to garbage collect. We have to throw away all the objects, which are free. This takes a bit of time. So we have the immediate cost. We'd rather not be spending time garbage collecting. We'd rather be spending time doing useful work. The less obvious consequence, though, is that in modern computer architecture, caches are really, really important. This is four, four megabytes long. But the CPU has caches in it that can talk about, at the most efficient, about 64 kilobytes worth of memory. And when we want to use something that's not inside of that space and that it's, uh, it's got mapped, it has to throw something out and pull the new thing in. So what happens in the CPU if we have a program that is going through memory like this? Well, we're allocating these three objects. We're using them for a very short amount of time. So that bit of memory is getting pulled into the CPU cache. And then we forget about it and we allocate more memory which isn't in the CPU cache, so we have to evict the old stuff and then pull this new stuff in. This is not very efficient at all. So we, ha we have secondary costs here as well. We also have analysis challenges. So if I have this program, I, just naively looking at it, do not know if this answer here is uh, 42. It might be, or it might not be. We, we don't know. Um, so, and that, that's a very simple property, it's not a very interesting one. Uh, a more interesting property in a more realistic program would be, do we know what type of value it is? For example, it's an integer. Because if we know that, then we can maybe, you know, avoid having to do some more dynamic lookup later. And the reason that this is so hard is that objects are reference types. And that means that an, the one object in memory can be referenced from lots of different places, potentially. And that means anything that holds the reference might be able to update it and change it. And also, that could even be done by a different thread in the 
worst case, which is uh, very interesting. And that, that really makes that analysis a lot of fun. So you might think, huh, if, if it's so hard to analyze Peltex, can you do anything uh, so far before the, the new stuff we're talking about today? And the answer is, oh, yes, we can. And uh, how do we do it? We cheat. Okay. So imagine that you, uh, you have a program and you, uh, you keep statistics on it. And you say, ah, well, I can't prove what the type of this, uh, this variable is. But every time I look at it, it seems to be an integer. Ah, OK. Let's suppose it always will be. So what we do is we, uh, we optimize the program as if we always get an integer. And just before we, uh, we go ahead and use it, we stick in something called a guard. And a guard is a very quick little check that says, is it really an integer? And if the answer is ever no, we bail out of the optimized code and we go back to the interpreted slow code that handles all of the cases in general. And we call this de-optimization. And it's a very powerful strategy. Um, in fact, we even use it strategically in a lot of places too. Uh, where we, we have loops, and one time in 10,000, they do something quite slow. A typical example is reading lines from a file, and most of the time, you're just pulling stuff out of a buffer, but then the buffer fit is empty, and you need to go and read from the file, so you take a different path. And we, we often actually handle that through de-optimization, interpret the slow bit of it, and then back into the optimized fast path afterwards. But, uh, guard down to free lunch either. Checking if we really have the type we expected costs something. And uh, because of that, uh, we, we have to you know, you know, spend some CPU cycles. It's not very many. It's two or three CPU instructions. It's pretty cheap, but it's, it's something. The secondary costs are more interesting, though. And the big one is that in order to fall back into the slow code, you might have to keep information around that otherwise you would discard. And this happens a lot. There's a lot of times where we would really love just to throw out some information and say, we don't need this anymore. In the optimized version of the program, we never use this value. But we can't actually delete the thing that produces it, because if we ever have to de-optimize, we need that data to be around. And uh, that's, a, that's a secondary cost. Now, Last year, I made a much more advanced algorithm for tracking and reducing the amount of that that we need to keep around, which helped a lot. But you know, it's still something. It's still a cost. And also, these instructions, these guards, take up space in the instruction cache in the CPU. And they take up space in the bytecode. And that means we might not apply other optimizations like inlining as a result of that. So here's an interesting thought. In general, we cannot reason about the lifetimes of, of all objects. But surely, we can reason about some objects. We can reason about objects that maybe are quite short-lived, that are only used in a very narrow part of the code. And uh, the answer is, well, yeah, we can. We can do that. And this is precisely the job of an escape analysis. Now, why is it called escape analysis? What's the escaping about? Here's what we do. We take a piece of code. And we do this at bytecode level, not at source code level. So we have turned the Perl 6 program into a sequence of very simple bytecode instructions executed by the virtual machine. And what we, uh, we do is we look through it until we see an allocation. And we say, ah, here we allocate an object. OK. And then we continue looking through the instructions. And whenever we see an instruction that touches or uses that object that we have allocated inside of this code, we look at it and say, oh, what does this instruction do with the object? And a big selection of instructions, things like storing an attribute into the object or reading an attribute from the object, we understand. We know what those are. And then there's some instructions. For example, we might return the object. We might put the object into a global variable. We might leak it to another object, which uh, we, we can't track. We don't understand the lifetime of. 
And if that ever happens, we see the object has escaped. Okay, it has escaped from the realm in which we can understand how the object is being used. And this is why it's called an escape analysis. We are analyzing the code to find out which objects escape and which ones do not. And the objects that do not escape, we know everything about. We know when they're allocated, we know when they're aliased, we know when they're written to, we know when they're read from. Okay, that's the, about the four main interesting things that can happen to them. But, okay, life is never quite so simple. And I, I'm not gonna show bytecode in this talk much, I'm gonna mostly show Perl 6 code, just as, to be more illustrative and a little bit easier. Take a look at this program, okay. This SV, the scalar value here, holding the, uh, the result, is passed to plus. In Perl 6, plus and every operator is just a subroutine. That means that this is escaping into the plus subroutine. Ah, okay. And uh, that in turn means that the result of the sign operation, which is a none, is assigned into this object, which then escapes, so it also escapes. So looking at it like this, it feels like this might be uh, pretty useless. However, inlining to the rescue. Inlining is uh, one of the top two optimizations that, uh, that exist in, in, in compiler optimization stuff uh, in general. There's, uh, there's the whole deoptimization and speculation strategy that's very, very important. Um, and uh, inlining is the other one. And the idea of inlining is that we take the code in something that we're going to call and we basically copy paste it in place of where we made the call. So instead of actually calling the sign function here, we put the implementation of the sign function. And this NQP colon colon thing, these are calls down to low level virtual machine operations. Okay, so uh, what we've done here is we've inlined that. We've inlined the plus, and you can see the add n operation there. There's a few other bits going on. Now inlining, a lot of people look at inlining and they say, ah, so the idea of inlining is that because the code that we're calling is so small, if we don't have to pay the cost of passing the argument, receiving the parameters, unpacking them, all of those sorts of things, making a call frame, clearing the call frame up, then we save a lot of cost on invocation. And this is very, this is true, this is true. But that is not why optimizing compiler writers love inlining, okay? It's kind of nice, it gives us a little bit of a win. The reason we love inlining is because it lets us take code, flatten it out, and then we have a much more interesting set of analyses we can do. Because now we understand, for example, what the sign function does and what the plus function does. And now we can say, ah, interesting. Because now, $SV here is used there, and decant just takes a value out of a scalar container, What's the value in there? It's this, uh, this boxed number. We unbox it, so we can now completely understand that the, the objects that are allocated for the boxing and for that scalar SV are existing entirely within this body of code, and then they go away, okay? That's two objects that we could potentially get rid of. So what do we do with the information? we perform an optimization called scalar replacement. This isn't actually anything to do with the Perl 6 scalar type. This is just what it's called in the academic literature. And the idea is that we take each attribute of the object, and instead of having it as an attribute, we just make a local variable to store the attributes in. And then we delete the allocation of the object, and whenever we see something that stores an attribute in the object, we turn it into a write of the local variable. And when we see a read, we turn it into a read of the local variable. So essentially, we deconstruct objects into a set of variables, one for each of the attributes. So this is the code before scalar replacement. It's what I just showed you after the inlining. 
So what we can do, and this, this is hand-waving quite a bit, because this happens in the bytecode, okay? But we, we at, declare two variables here, and you'll just have to bear with me that these are not really allocating scalars, okay? This is why it's a bit hard to show this in Perl 6. But imagine those, those don't allocate anything. And, and a scalar has two attributes. It has a value, that's the thing that it holds, and it has a descriptor, and that's things like type information, is it read-write, all of those sorts of things. It's name for debugging, okay? Metadata about that variable. And then we say, ah, well, actually, what we really do when we assign into a scalar container is just bind to its value slot. That's, that's all we're doing. So now we've got rid of the mention of SV, and uh, then we can repeat the process, and we say, ah, that num, actually we can just have a, a local native num64 variable, that's like a double in C, and we can stick this result directly into there, and then we can use it straight over here. And then we tidy up and we get this, which is uh, quite neat. Has a lot less, uh, there's no allocations in there, uh, except um, for this, uh, this box here, which is passed off to, uh, to do something, okay, which escapes. So two less memory allocations. While you can't see it in the code, I can tell you that we also will have got rid of a couple of different uh, guards for deoptimization as well. In fact, the entire scalar container there, that entire object, has gone away. It's been completely optimized out. That's, that's pretty nice. Okay, so enough hand-waving. Let's do some mathematics. Okay. How is this actually done? So, Unfortunately, it's, it's a little bit difficult to show it in, in Pulse 6 code, so to do this, I'll actually have to go and show you a little bit of bytecode. Um, this is pretty tricky. Um, the full thing is uh, a, probably a, a few more months away, um, but what I'll show you today is uh, the basics. Okay? These are actually implemented in the latest uh, Rakuto and Morvm, uh, so uh, if, you're, if you're running those, you're, you're taking advantage of these, uh, these new optimizations. So, we basically do two steps. The first one is called an abstract interpretation. Um, and what's an abstract interpretation? Okay. An abstract interpretation is a technique for analyzing a program. So when we write, a, when we make a programming language, a very simple way to implement it is to write an interpreter. And an interpreter just takes each statement or each expression in the program and calculates it. And normally, an interpreter works on real values. And there's, there's one of these in, uh, in Perl 5, okay? So the, the Perl interpreter, we say, what's at the heart of that is, you know, we pass the program, we get the tree, we walk over the tree, and we, uh, we interpret that tree. And by that, we mean compute the thing that that tree wants us to compute, and that's how programs are executed. An abstract interpretation says, well, we don't have real data. So what we'll instead do is we will, instead of having real values, consider the program with abstract values. So for example, this, we don't know the, the value of this integer, but we know it's an integer, okay? So we'll just emulate running the program for, for any integer. And that's why it's abstract, okay? It's an interpretation of the program that abstracts away details that we don't know about or that are too specific for us to do an interesting optimization of the program. And this is an extremely general technique. In fact, I think that the paper that described this is the most referenced paper in, in like the entire compiler optimizing literature. It's also older than me. Okay, so this is not, not a new idea. Um, now, this, this technique applies to lots and lots of analyses. And uh, what we'll do is we will do an abstract interpretation where we go through the program and we look for allocations, we look for usages of those allocations, and as we do that, we'll also build up a list of what I call transforms. And a transform is just an operation we can perform that will change the program in some way. 
And the transforms in question will do things like deleting allocations and turning attribute reads and writes into local variable reads and writes for the replaced attributes. So let's walk through a, an example, okay? So this, this is uh, how things look in our bytecode. This is the name of an instruction. This is fast create. Fast create is a, an object allocation instruction, and it's, it's fast because we know exactly what type it's going to allocate, okay? And in this case, it's a scalar container. So what we do is we allocate this type of object, and we put it into this register. So we don't have variables at this level. We just have numbered storage slots, okay? And the R is for register. This is register number 10. Now, one of the really interesting things that happens when we compile programs is we try and use as few registers as we possibly can. Um, and that means that the program needs less working space when we run it. However, um, actually having the same register reused for lots of things makes the program harder to analyze. So when we want to optimize programs that have done this, we go and take them to pieces and figure out all of the individual usages. And we basically do a renaming of the program so that every variable has one place that we assign to it in the code. And these numbers, the two, is just saying version two of register 10. Okay, and that, that's, that's what's happening there. So this is, this is very nice. And uh, what, we, what we get now is a table of things that we are tracking. So when I see this instruction, I say, well, we have an allocation. We're gonna try and understand its scope, whether it escapes. It's a scalar. We know that it's been stored into this register 10, and I'm not really sure where I'm going to store its attributes yet, but I'll make these two what they call hypothetical registers, okay? We'll make them real later, and we'll call them H1 and H2, and H1 will correspond to the value attribute of the scalar object, and H2 to the descriptor one. It doesn't escape. And the transform for this instruction is to delete it. Because if we succeed in optimizing this program or this allocation, the allocation will be deleted. This is a set. This is just where one register is assigned the value from another register. That's a, an aliasing operation. And so uh, what we'll do is we'll just add it to the list of aliases. So now we're saying R102 points to this object that was allocated, and uh, R53 also does. This P6O bind, this is binding that is putting one value into an attribute of the object. What does the instruction mean? It means that offset 16 inside of object R53, store a reference to R21, okay? Whatever object is in there, or whatever value is in there. So this is going to be turned into just a set instruction, which is much cheaper, much simpler, much easier to analyze. Now one of the other things we make a little note of here is we say, ah, and if we knew something, some facts, for example, what type this object that was in the register R2 is, we'll attach them and say that this hypothetical register has that, that type as well. So we can track information inside of objects, which we couldn't do before without this analysis. A get, that's just reading from an object, reading one value. So uh, here, we turn that into a set as well, okay? So uh, that is just reading from this replacement register. And again, we, we say, ah, and we actually, before, when we did a bind into the object and then we read the value back, we had to assume we didn't know what type it was. But now because we're tracking this all, we know what type it is, okay? It's gonna be whatever the type of the thing that we stored on the last slide was. And that's really nice because if I, see I read that into R42 there, here's a guard saying is R42 a num? And it might just be that our analysis by tracking inside of the object means we can throw away that guard. Okay, we can say, ah, I don't have to check at runtime that it's uh, really an, uh, a num, for example, because I've just proven that it is a num. That's nice. Here's another allocation. 
Okay, so we allocate a, a num this time. And uh, in this case, it's used in a return instruction. Okay, that means it escapes. So we just flip this to yes. So after this abstract interpretation, I have a table like this. Then I take my table. This one I throw away because it escapes here at the bottom, so I can't do anything with this. And then I'll apply these transformations, which will delete the allocation, rewrite the attribute accesses into simpler things, delete the guard, delete the set instruction, and what we get is a scalar replacement of that allocation in the program, and we are done. Well, I wish we were done. And uh, actually, the, the fun that always happens with this is that uh, deoptimization comes and spoils your day. Because what happens if we hit a point in the program where we have taken objects, we've replaced all of the attributes with local variables, the object no longer exists, then we fail a guard, and we have to fall back and run the slow interpreted version of the program. Well, the interpreter wants the object to be there. And if it isn't, the interpreter is going to say something like, um, uh, sig seg v. Okay, so this is not good. What we have to do is materialize the object. And to do that, we need a table telling us if this guard fails, this is guarding that this object is a, an integer object instance, then we should reconstruct the object from hypothetical registers one and two and stick it into the register R5, okay? Now, that, that almost works, not quite, why? Because we need to also make sure that the hypothetical registers live as well. So we also have to keep track of, there it is, that fact as well. Okay, that H1 and H2 are going to be used if we deoptimize here. And the reason we have to do that is because other, perhaps over eager optimizations later might come along and sweep away all of those things, and then we would you know, have a broken object if we ever went back to the interpreter. So it's not too bad. Um, it's not too easy, but it's not too bad. The, the hard part is knowing which and, and trying to minimize the number of these things that you have to do while still being able to correctly do it. So being able to do it at all, that's not hard. Being able to do it as little as we can get away with, um, that, that's a bit harder. But uh, I, I think the current algorithm is probably doing about as well as is possible. So that that I just described, it's implemented, uh, it's enabled in the, uh, the latest MoreVM and Recudo uh, releases, um, provided they got shipped. And um, that's nice. Unfortunately, that's only part of the way there because it doesn't handle quite a few things. And what I'll just do for the last few moments of the talk is tell you about that. But before that, let's do a benchmark. Okay, does this work? Does it work? We all want faster. So uh, this benchmark here is uh, the poster child for escape analysis almost. And uh, at the moment, we are quite limited in how well we can do with this, but we can still, still help it a bit. So what we have is a class point, which has uh, an x and a y coordinate. We then uh, go through a loop, we make a point object, and then we just total the x and the y. And it's not so useful, but what it's doing is just doing a set of common object operations. And it's quite common if we have short-lived objects in our programs abstracting things away that we end up with situations a lot like this. That's a Perl 5 version of it. Okay, I won't go through that. Uh, but uh, it's, it's just written using, it's not, it's not a pretty Perl 5 version of it, but it's a pure Perl 5 version of it, not using any of the, the nice object systems. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's therefore probably, probably about as fast as we can, uh, we can get it. You can. I suspect it can go faster, but yeah. Okay, so. This middle one is uh, Perl 6 without any escape analysis being done, okay? You can see it's already um, an amount faster than the, the Perl 5 one. 
Um, and here, with escape analysis on, we almost managed to bring it down to half the time of the, uh, the Pearl 5 one. Um, that's not bad. It's a start. Okay, it's something. Um, one of the interesting things, though, is that we're doing a really bad job because the algorithm is still so limited. So this performance improvement, which is you know, about almost a, a quarter or maybe nearly a third off the runtime, comes just from the elimination of the, the scalar container $p in that program holding the point. So uh, this here. The, a hash. So, okay, this, you, you don't see a constructor here. The reason is it's because it's generated for you. And inside of there, it uh, slurps all of the things in the hash, in new, and then it unpacks the values, okay? And we optimize that away with the escape analysis, and we get rid of various guards. But we are still missing the point object itself, the scalar containers for points attributes, total, uh, that total variable, all of the nth, and all of their associated guards. Because ideally, if you think about it, what do we want this program to optimize into? A loop that does total equals total plus five. Okay, that, that's the goal. And that, that is what we should be able to reach. So, are we halfway there? Maybe, maybe, okay. But uh, how do we get the rest? I'm currently uh, implementing this one. This is handling of transitive references. So the idea is that here we allocate a scalar, here we allocate a number, we uh, just put the, the value into the number, and then we stick this number into this, uh, this scalar container here, okay, this R102. Now, in the current Recudo, it will just say, in the current uh, optimizer, it will just say that escapes because it can't track objects being assigned into other objects. However, I have a shiny branch which actually tracks that. How does it do it? Uh, we just need to extend our inter abstract interpretation a little bit. So what we do is we say, well, if we see an object that we're tracking, that we know about the allocation of, being assigned or bound into an attribute of another object we know the allocation of, what we'll do is we'll completely delete this instruction because we don't need it anymore. Okay, we're taking these objects apart and deconstructing them. So that's just an aliasing operation. It can go away. And we'll track the facts and then we'll add each one, this hypothetical register, as an alias for this. That's it. That, that's about the only thing we have to do in the abstract interpretation. I was surprised, actually. I expected it to be much harder. What is much harder is the optimization. And uh, this, is the bit, this is the reason the branch hasn't been merged yet. In theory, what I've done should be broken. In practice, I haven't found the program that breaks it yet. Okay, so I'll need to write one that breaks it um, and then fix the bug. But basically, the, the problem we have is that if we have two objects and we replace both of them, but they referenced each other, you can't just go through a table and reconstruct each object. You'll have to allocate and stub each one, put them somewhere, and then do all the referencing and wiring them together again. Um, not impossible, just, just, you know, needs a little bit of thought and peace and quiet to implement. So that one's soon. After that, So one of the things I want to do next, beyond that, is extend the algorithm to do something called partial escape analysis. Imagine we have an object, and we have a branch, some if statement, that is occasionally taken, maybe uh, one time in 10. And along that if statement branch, the object escapes. With a traditional escape analysis, which is what we've got implemented so far, we just consider an object escaping, and we don't do any optimization. But what if instead of doing that, we said, let's take the allocation of the object and put it off until we're inside of that branch? And then in 90% of the cases, we don't actually have to allocate the object. That's nice. 
So this is called partial escape analysis. It's an escape along part of the program. Okay, and uh, that'll be one of the next big things to do. In fact, the algorithm that is being implemented here has been engineered from the start in order to support this. So this is the, the plan all along. Um, but uh, that's one of the next things. Another problem that we have, and this, this is a bit of a, an interesting one, um, Perl 6 big int. So an int object in Perl 6 isn't just wrapping up some, say, 32 or 64 bit CPU native integer. It's an integer that automatically upgrades to a big integer. And when it upgrades, then we, uh, we do a malloc of some memory to hold that, that big integer. And normally this is very easy. The object gets freed, the garbage collector does the freeing of that, uh, that big integer memory, and we're done. If we do escape analysis, we need to make sure that we don't ever leak that malloc bit of memory, we don't ever uh, double free it or anything like that. So we need to figure out a way to, to deal with this. Um, so uh, that, that'll need a bit more analysis and so on. Um, again, doable need, needs for it. Another problem that we have is that if we have a, a branch and we, uh, we allocate an object on either side of the branch and it's merged, and uh, only one of those objects, of course, gets used because we only were on one side of the if statement or the other. If the same type was allocated on either side of the branch and then they come together, or if we had an object that went into the branch and wasn't, uh, wasn't escaping on either side, what happens at the end of the branch? Okay, and at the moment, we just conservatively say, ah, well, it always escapes. We don't understand what to do about this. Um, Whereas the, the better answer, of course, would be, well, we should look at those states and, uh, and should try and do something smart and try and get away with as few allocations as we can. And that is the simple version of the bigger problem, which is the, probably the final hard one, which is uh, loops. Now, loops really mess up the job because uh, the way this abstract interpreter works is it goes through the code, follows each path, so if we have a, an if, we take both branches, we analyze both branches, we come back together. But if we have a loop, what we need to know is the escape information about all of the various allocations on all of the ways we can reach the entry to the loop. But if we haven't analyzed the loop yet, we don't know what those will be at the start of the loop. And the answer is that you, uh, you actually repeat the analysis. Okay, so you go through the loop, and then you have the information, and then you go back, and you repeat the analysis of the loop again, and you say, did we get the same result? And if the answer is no, then we do it again, and eventually it converges. And uh, in mathematical terms, we call that a fixed point, which is just a very fancy way of saying, do something again and again until the answer stops changing. Okay. so. Uh, Again, it's not too bad. Um, you might wonder, why do I have all of these transform objects? Why not just do the work there and then? And uh, the, answer, the answer is, well, partly because uh, you know, we, it might escape and we sh maybe shouldn't do the work. This is the other part of the answer, that actually we can't do those transforms straight away because we have to go through loops a couple of times to say, have we actually calculated the right escape data? Um, it gets worse. <laughs> it always gets worse. Um, I realized when I was doing this, so we, we have this really nice optimization where uh, it's called on-stack replacement. So imagine you have a loop, and it's hot code. You're going round and round and round this loop. And we say, ah, this, this code is, uh, is, is getting used a lot, but we're in the middle of a loop. How can we optimize it? And what we can actually do is we can hit a point in the loop and replace the code that is running with a faster version of the code. And we call that on-stack replacement. One of the problems with this is that if we're doing escape analysis and we have objects that we are taking apart, we'll actually have to take them apart when we enter the optimized code. And uh, that's, that's also a fairly tricky calculation, I guess. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. Um, and you know, if, if we can just get away with calculating normal escape data or if it's harder than that, I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll have to see. 
And finally, all of this is about doing it to normal objects, but what if we could uh, do some more things? What if we had a, a hash, and all the keys of the hash that were ever used were constants? Could we do this to the hash? Or if we had a very small fixed size array, could we take apart the array and get rid of the array elements and then roll loops? So there's some, some other nice things we can probably do there as well. Okay, so that was escape analysis. Um, it's a new optimization that we're putting into uh, the Perl 6 compiler, uh, an optimizer, to deal with the fact that the language involves a lot of objects. Those objects have both direct costs in terms of the memory allocation, they have indirect costs in terms of memory fragmentation, uh, cache misses as a result of that, um, restricting our ability to analyze and optimize programs. And through this escape analysis technique and the scalar replacement that we can then do with that, um, that means that we can start to see inside of objects, deconstruct objects, eliminate the existence in many cases of a lot of short-lived objects. And uh, by doing that, hopefully, get uh, a very nice speed up indeed. Okay, so uh, thank you. I hope that was more interesting than uh, brain melting. Um, f for me, this is brain melting. Okay, this is this is what I, I do when I want a headache. So uh, yeah. for some reason, I find that fun. Okay, <laughs> I don't know. I've probably not got that much time for questions. Maybe I can take one or two or. I'm diligent about annotating my attributes with types. Are the new optimizations still relevant? Uh, if you, uh, if you uh, put native types, for example, on your attributes. No, but just the normal Just normal ones. ones. Um, yeah, I mean, they. It, I don't think it makes a big difference, honestly. I mean, it's, if, uh, you won't be paying for the, um, the costs of checking the types. So basically, you'll normally get, you'll very often get your type checks done for free because of these analyses. Um, will you gain anything from it? Uh, probably not that much, um, but maybe something. If you put native type annotations on there, you potentially gain quite a lot. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh, any more? Okay, I don't see anyone. Okay, feel free to come and talk to me afterwards as well. Thank you.